Um, hey, we're continuing this uh, new series we started a couple weeks ago. We're going through the entire Bible uh, this coming year, um, and we're calling it Trilogy. If the Bible were a trilogy, uh, book one would be the Old Testament, which is all about the diagnosis of the disease that we have as humanity. We're broken. Uh, something does not work right in, the, in humanity. Uh, book two would be the cure, all about Jesus. Jesus is the cure. And book three, you could call maybe the, you know, the history of the early church in the book of Acts, but really it's about the treatment, uh, which is the, when the Holy Spirit comes, his ministry, he does, the, it's, we, having received the cure was of Jesus, the Holy Spirit then comes upon his church and, and deals with the symptoms in our lives, uh, administers the treatment of himself and, and begins to transform us uh, from the inside out over and over, uh, over uh, time. Well, this morning we are continuing uh, this book one part, the Old Testament, uh, uh, which was going to take us to the end of the year. And um, it really is all about the diagnosis. The Old Testament doesn't show you, t- you how to get saved. It, it shows you that you need a savior. It doesn't tell you how to be righteous. It shows you what righteousness looks like and that no amount of effort on your part or being religious or following the law, can, you, you cannot achieve that righteousness. And, uh, and two weeks ago, we looked at how uh, humanity contracted the disease. Uh, Adam and Eve, they, they, our first mother and father, they, they ate the forbidden fruit um, because they wanted to be like God, essentially, to take his place. And so they joined the rebellion of Satan, who also fell because he wanted to be like God, to take God's place. And, uh, and so God said, in effect, okay, you want to be God? You can be God. And he sent them out of his presence as if to say, let's see how you do without me at the center. And that was the essence of when we contracted the sin disease and became broken. And then last week, we we saw how that begins to play out. We saw the first symptoms uh, of the sin disease, the first anger, the first depression, the first um, self-entitlement, and the same uh, jealousy, the the first murder. And that account of Cain and Abel, it really was instructive. We saw, we really focused on Cain last week, and, and we saw a couple of things. One, we saw that just the predatory nature of sin, but we also saw about the tender-hearted nature of God, because even though God had to drive Cain out of his presence, um, God placed a mark on Cain. Uh, to, so he wouldn't be killed. He, he protected Cain. What that taught us is that even though Cain is unrepentant, and he is totally unrepentant in that story, God loves Cain. God cares for Cain. And, and, and that's just a remarkable thing about that, that lesson, if, there's, if that account tells us anything, it's that God cares for unrepentant people. He loves unrepentant people. He wants them to return to him. He gives them opportunities to do so. It's, it's, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance, the book of Romans says. Ezekiel says, I do not take delight in the wicked, but rather that they would turn, turn and live, God says. And, and, and so God, maybe as God, he showed kindness, he showed grace to Cain, along with some hardship and, and helping him come to the end himself by being banished to the east. Uh, hopefully that led Cain to repentance. We don't know. Uh, but he was sent out from God's presence. God's heart was still for Cain. His heart is for unrepentant people. And so we don't know Cain repented. We hope he did. What we do know is, um, is as we proceed from Cain and Abel to the two next big events uh, in kind of the, the Genesis drama, the drama of the Old Testament, the, the flood of Noah and the Tower of Babel, uh, thousands of years pass between Cain and Abel and the flood and tower, um, civilizations could have risen and fallen. Technologies discovered and lost, we don't know. What we do know is that as the population grew and grew, humanity, culture became more and more corrupt, more and more violent. Uh, the early part of Genesis 6 says it got to the point where every, everybody's thought was on evil all the time. The inclination of the heart was evil all the time. The text of uh, Genesis 6 says that such that eventually God came to the decision just to wipe out all of humanity and to start over with one relatively good man, Noah and his family. He sent the flood and he wiped out all of humanity except for Noah and his family. Now, why did God do that? Why the flood? And the answer is, I don't know. But I have a theory 
And, uh, and maybe to say that this is why God did the flood is maybe that's too strong of a statement, but I, I do think that there are some very clear lessons that we're to glean from the flood event that humanity is supposed to take away from the flood event. And, it, and it's hinted at in the scripture in Genesis chapter eight, after the flood happens and, and they're, they're exiting the boat and, um, and God gives a, a kind of a new covenant to know. We call it the Noahic covenant. We looked at this briefly uh, last summer or last year. And after the flow's over, Noah comes out and God essentially uh, says to them, uh, he, you know, he you know, built this oratory, did a sacrifice, and the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, and then said in his heart, quote, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. Every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. Um, there's an ongoing ba- debate, I'm sure you know it. Uh, is, 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 is humanity basically good or is he basically bad? Uh, because if we're basically good people, then the problem of evil is really fixable. The problem of evil is fixable if, if human beings are basically good through reform and education and addressing the evils of our society. In other words, the problem with the world, if it's not us, then it's our environment. But what the Bible really clearly teaches and what our text I think here alludes to is that at our core, we are not basically good, that we're diseased, we're broken. It doesn't mean we don't do good things. It doesn't mean we're creating God's image and, and God loves us and he's, he created us to be these glorious creatures, but something is broken inside. We have the sin disease. We are curved inward, as Martin Luther called it. The problem is us. And what the flood does is it really eliminates any kind of notion that we might have that we can fix things on our own. Uh, because if the problem really is just the externals of the world and we're just basically good, then yeah, it would make sense. Just wipe everything out, start over with one relatively good person and their family and things should be better, right? But did that fix things? No, because the problem is in the human heart. We're broken on the inside. And so part of what happened in the flood or what we take from the flood is, is the flood helps humanity kind of begin to come to the end of ourselves and realize that we have the disease. It's all about a breaking process for humanity. Um, it's like an AA, 12-step program. So if you're overcoming alcohol or, or some other chemical dependency, they say you have to come to the end of yourself before you have to hit rock bottom before you really can, can receive kind of healing. Same thing here. I think God is helping through the flood event and other things we're going to see in the Old Testament, helping humanity come to the end of ourselves, the end of our himself, it's ourselves, uh, such that we absolutely know that we need a savior. It's all helping us diagnose the disease, which kind of leads to the next big event um, after, uh, in uh, the uh, in the in the biblical story is the the Tower of Babel. So after after the flood's over and they did hit that, uh, what, what they grounded the boat, which John says is usually not a good thing, but in this case it was a good thing, and they exit the the uh, the ark. And God essentially says to Noah what he said to Adam and Eve. Uh, he had said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, he says the same thing to Noah. Uh, kind of gives a fresh uh, covenant, uh, be fruitful and multiply and, and fill uh, the earth. However, they didn't do that. Instead, as humanity began to repopulate the earth after the years of the flood and generations that followed, they hung out on what's called the, the plain of Shinar and humanity basically kind of stuck together. We don't need God. God, we can build a name for ourselves. We can, we can build a tower to the heavens. We can reach the stars. There's nothing that's going to stop what we uh, can't do. In other words, they're full of pride. And if there's one obstacle to the gospel, it's pride. And so again, God engages in a process of helping humanity come to the end of ourselves. Uh, and there's a breaking process that continues to happen. And here, what he essentially enacts is kind of really a divide and conquer strategy. He, he, at this point, he confuses the languages. Um, and uh, I, we don't know if this is just kind of a simplistic summary of, of something happening. We don't know it's a, of, of how it all happened. But basically, uh, language groups emerge. Uh, people groups emerge uh, from that event. And it's kind of like God divides humanity into different people groups. 
And then, as we're going to see starting next week and really through the rest of the Old Testament, he just picks one of those people groups to be the launching pad to which he would eventually reach out to save every other. And so next week we're going to look at how he calls Abraham and through Abraham and his descendants, the people of the Jews, and he picks this one people group and he begins for several centuries to drill true things about himself, his nature into this one people group and he's going to teach them the law and teach them how to be religious and he's going to show that through that even if I were to reveal myself to you very clearly, even that's not going to, it's not going to cure the disease. He's helping humanity exhaust all their options and to see that we absolutely need the cure, absolutely of the Savior. It's all getting ready for Jesus. And, and so that's kind of where we're headed in the Old Testament. But for now, the point I want to emphasize is, is that once God does pick one people group, Abraham and his descendants, the Jews, though they are his special chosen people, they're chosen for a purpose. And part of the purpose is that God loves just as much every other people group, every other culture, every other people group that, that were kind of dividing these people groups in language who, who were then forced to spread out and fulfill that command to be fruitful, mauled by fill the earth. They go into various parts of the earth and God's heart is still for each of those people group. He is even now, uh, has been through the centuries, I think, even, even as God was dealing with Israel in the Old Testament, he was helping those people groups come to the end of themselves and come to the place where they know also that they need a savior and he was also giving to them a witness of some kind, a a testimony of some kind about himself. And we see that in the scriptures. Um, In Paul's sermon to, um, in Athens to uh, Mars Hill, and and we're going to go to Athens. That's one of our stops in the Mediterranean arc cruise. And I get to, I was just talking to what Lauren, who is it on Lauren about yeah, you, we stood, you stood there, and so I'm going to be able to preach on Mars Hill, exactly where Paul preached this sermon. And Matt, you told me about that too. Uh, well, he's preaching to these philosophers in Athens, and he's basically talking about how, how God uh, has still been working on them, even though he, the gospel is just now coming to them. He says this in Acts 17, 26 to 28. Um, Paul's saying, and he ma- he's kind of describing kind of he's the history of the world, and he made from one man... Every nation, every people group is what that means of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries for their dwelling place, place they, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. And then Paul brilliantly he quotes one of their poets, one of their philosophers, uh, which shows you how well read Paul is. And he, but he's making the point too that God can speak through, even though these are non-Christians, they're not Jews, but God's heart is for them and God's been reaching out them. And he, and he implies that even those who have yet to hear the gospel and they don't have any connection to, to, to uh, the revelation in the Old Testament yet, but they could maybe find their way toward him, find him, seek him, that they're seekers in every people group uh, that God has left some kind of, uh, of trace of himself, a memory of himself. Uh, Paul says something very similar in Acts 14. Here he's talking to a different people group in Asia Minor, present day Turkey, uh, who are a bunch of idol worshipers. And he says, in the past, he has let all nations, all people groups go their own way. Uh, yet even then, he has not left himself without testimony. God has left testimonies of himself in every people group on the planet. And, and he's, we certainly know he's done that just through creation. I mean, he, we can see God's glory in creation, right? Uh, uh, Paul talks about in Romans 1 and just how God provides for us, gives crops for the evil and, and the good. It says in one part of the scripture and, and God provided for Cain uh, and uh, he's given us a conscience. We can, you know, there's, there's something inside us tells us something's right or wrong. And uh, Ecclesiastes says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of humanity, uh, that there's an eternal longing for God, a sense of right and wrong. Um, But remarkably, also we find in various people groups, um, what's been also implanted in in some, maybe all, and we just don't know about all, um, something that missionaries call um, a redemptive analogy. Uh, Tim Keller called it a memory trace 
of himself. And this is fascinating. So many missionaries, when they first come to people groups who've never received the gospel, and they're, they're coming to the first time to, to share about Jesus, share about the cure, um, often they'll, they'll, these are demon worshiping or idol worshiping cultures, people groups, tribes, and, and as they're sharing the gospel, as they're learning the languages, uh, they often hear legends of these various people groups, tribes, of have we once had a memory of the almighty true God but we lost it, or we angered this God, we, we lost contact, and so now we have to worship these demons over and over again in various cultures. Uh, there are these v- stories that emerge that missionaries have, have shared, and also these, what they call redemptive analogies, some, maybe some weird part of their culture uh, that once discovered this, it, they use it as, a, as an analogy for the gospel. It's like God implanted that through that particular culture or people group as a bridge for communicating the gospel. And I'll give you four examples. I've, I've kind of shared this concept before, and I always give the same two examples, which I'm going to give again, but I, I give you two more this time. Um, the first is the Incas. You know, the, great, the greatest um, king of the Incas was a guy named um, uh, Pashakuti. And Pashakuti is the one who actually had Machu Picchu built as kind of a fortress uh, for the um, upper classes, the nobility. And uh, he was really a fascinating uh, king. He was their greatest king. He built up the capital city of Cuzo. Uh, he built this remarkable temple, would have rivaled Solomon's temple, uh, dedicated to the sun god. Uh, who their, their name was, the sun god's name was Inti. That's who the Incans worshipped. They worshipped the sun. Uh, they called Inti. And, um, but in uh, Pashakuti's later years, he began to question how could this how could this be the god is this he began to question is enti the sun god really the one true god because he realized he just does the same thing every day i mean he's not spontaneous he's not creative it's just like he does the same path it's almost like he's a slave He's, someone else is in charge of him. And then he said, he reasoned, you know, the smallest cloud could cover him up and we can't even see him. And really through reason that God had given him, he began, to, as, as Paul said to the, to the Athenian, begin to, to find out, to reach out to God, to, to discern. And, and he actually came to a place of, of really re- rejecting uh, Enti as the sun god. And then he began to, to study his own people's legends and he discovered or rediscovered that there was an ancient belief of the Incas of a one true God named Veracocha but that they had lost kind of kind of con- contact with him. There's there an old temple somewhere that had been dedicated to Veracocha, the one true God, but uh, it was in ruin. And then he began to remember his father, uh, Hatum Tupac, had once said to him that he had a dream in which Veracocha appeared to him and said, I am the one true God, creator of heaven and earth. That God had left some kind of memory trace of himself uh, in this particular people group. And so uh, Pashakuti, he actually, he became a follower of the one true God, uh, the living God, um, the creator of heaven and earth. Didn't know much about him. He was vague and didn't have a complete understanding. Uh, and, uh, but he actually gathered all the nobles together, all the elite class, and he kind of shared this logic with them, and he actually led them out of worship of the sun and into worship of the of Veracucha, the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth. Sadly, though, they, they kind of discern, let's not tell the lower classes this. We don't want to disturb their faith in the sun God. And you know, to his credit, maybe he was hoping it would trickle down eventually, but they didn't. They kept it to themselves, uh, this worship of the one true God. And so the lower uneducated classes still worshiped the sun, which was unfortunate because, um, un- I mean, can you imagine missionaries coming and be the first ones to, to share? We can tell you how to have relationship with, Ver- with the one true God and how it's, how it's happened. But unfortunately, the conquistadors got there first and they defeated the Incans. And then you know what they did? They slaughtered the entire upper class and nobility and just let the lower classes live. And so now all you have are those who still believe in the sun God, and that's who the missionaries eventually came to share with. And it was a longer process of leading them in, to Jesus. 
There's a better ending for the second example, the Santal. Uh, they are a people group in uh, the northeast corner of India, north of Calcutta, and a bearded Norwegian missionary named Lars uh, Skrufrud. Oh, that's, a, that's a great Norwegian name. So I'm, Lars, he comes to this region in the 1800s, remote tribe. He, re, he re, re figures, I got my work cut out for me. This is going to be so tough. They're completely cut off from any kind of Jewish or Christian influence. I'm going to have to start from scratch with these people. Uh, but then, to his utter amazement, as once he learned the language, as he started to uh, share the gospel, um, the Santal were electrified by his message. And they began to hear Santal sages things, saying like, what this stranger must be saying is, Thakujiu has not forgotten about us after all this time. And as kind of Lars continued to kind of figure out what they were talking about, they found out that, that Thakujiu literally translated is the genuine God in their language, the genuine God. And, and so, you know, Lars was a little confused, but you worship all these idols because they worship these idols and, and kind of demonic type figures. And, and why don't you worship the genuine God? And, and, one of their sages, Kolyan, explained to Lars their legend that long ago, Thakujiu, the genuine God, created the first man, Haram, and the first woman, Ao, and placed them far in the west of India in a region called Pahiri Papiri. That's a fun name. Uh, there, a being named Lita tempted them to disobey the genuine God, and the result was that they discovered that they were naked and felt ashamed. Does that sound familiar to anybody? They also have the legends of the flood and that after the flood, their people group went over the mountains, eventually settled in this region that they're at. And a little by little, he said, our memory of the Kajuru uh, faded and we lost contact with him. Uh, but some sages would try to remind the people, but they kind of filtered into the, the kind of the idol worship of that area. Now, thankfully, Lars didn't say, oh, well, Thikarju is, is a false god. You got to worship Yahweh. No, he, he, like the Apostle Paul, when he was at Mars Hill, he saw this was a bridge. On, uh, at Mars Hill, when Paul was in Athens, he was preaching, he, 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 he was disturbed by all the idols, but he saw one idol with an inscription to an unknown god. And so Paul used that as the bridge. He, he said, the god you worship is unknown. I'm going to proclaim to you right now. And he proclaimed the gospel to him. And that's similar to what um, Lars did here. He said, Thakurjiu, who you uh, have lost contact with, you say he's the one true God, almighty, all powerful. I have come to share with you how you can have contact with him again. And once he shared that, tens of thousands of the Santal began to streaming to be baptized. And they raised up their own missionaries as well to tell uh, their own people and to go to the other regions that Thakurji or the genuine God had not forgotten them after all this time. Uh, a fourth example or third example that I have shared before, I'll share again, is, is the Sawi people of New Guinea. Um, they were a primitive tribe from New Guinea that Don Richardson and his, family, and his wife reached out to. And the thing about this tribe is that they're one of only five or six tribes in the world who are both headhunters and cannibals. You know, usually they're just one or the other, but they got both those things going for them. So that's pretty cool. And um, the other weird thing about this particular tribe, the Sawi people, is that and, and really made it difficult as they first began to reach out to these people is that they saw treachery as a virtue. In other words, if, you, if they were to invite somebody from another tribe kind of over for dinner and then have them for dinner, that would be like the best thing you could do. They would be really all into that. Uh, that was like, there, it was a virtue, and which has made it hard to preach the gospel because when they started telling the gospel and they got to part of Judas, they thought Judas was the hero of the story because of the treachery. Um, and so... The, break, the breakthrough, though, happened as Don and his wife, Carol Richardson, discovered the redemptive analogy that God had implanted in this people group. They, they were going to leave. They threatened to leave the tribe unless the tribe made peace with this other warring tribe. And the, the tribes didn't want them to do that because they were providing medicine and tools. And, and so the way in this culture that they would make peace uh, is that the, the one chief would take his only baby son and give that baby son to the, 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 the chief of the other tribe. And, and as long as that baby was alive, there'd be peace. It was called the peace child. And so Don Richardson was able to share that Jesus is God's 
peace child who is given for us and he's alive. He will never die. He is uh, for us. He is the peace child. And, and when he was able to share that, they understood and two thirds of that tribe became Christian. The Holy Spirit provided a redemptive analogy because God is, loves every people group. Uh, one final example I'll share, and I've shared this one before, but it's very personal to Sandy me, the Korean people um, uh, of Burma and parts of northern Thailand. Years ago, when Sandy and I were like young 20s, it's pre-Hannah, no kids. Um, I was going to show a picture of me, but I have got this weird goatee, and I'm too embarrassed to show it. Um, <laughs> but um, we, we got it, went on this mission trip to northern Thailand, and we're traveling through... Um, kind of Buddhist territory, the Hmong people uh, in, in that part of Thailand. And, and, but we get through that area, we get to the place where these, these Korean people are, and suddenly I see all these churches. There's ch- churches everywhere. And, and I actually got to preach in a Korean church, which was pretty cool. And, and it was clear these churches had been around for a long time, like, like, like centuries, uh, or <clears throat> over 100 years at least. But um, I didn't know why. I asked somebody why, and they didn't really couldn't uh, give me a good answer. But when I came back, I, I, I researched it, and there's an amazing story behind the Korean people. Uh, they originally were in a place of, of Burma, and uh, before missionaries first came to the Korean people, uh, they had, uh, basically they worshipped evil spirits that they called gnats, uh, but they also had a legend that before they were enslaved to gnats, that they had a relationship with the one true God who they called Iwa, but that they angered this one true God and, and, and that they lost his book as well, and so they were kind of driven from his presence, uh, but their priest called Bukas would, uh, would kept reminding them of their legend that one day, a visitor from a distant land would come to them and bring them the book that they lost, which would show them how to get relationship again with the Wa. Can you imagine being the first unsuspecting missionary to walk into that? It's like somebody just set the ball for the tea. And, um, and then can you imagine them translating the, the Bible for this people group about how you can have a relationship with Yahweh, which sounds very much like Iwa. Um, and the story of how that happens is fascinating. Uh, I can point you some resources if you'd like to dig into it further. But long story short, when missionaries did come um, and discovered those redemptive analogies and legends embedded in their culture from ancient times, there were mass conversions uh, in every village and, and just uh, uh, all, you know, thousands and thousands of Korean people coming to know Jesus. And again, Sandy and I got to be among them and, and work on an orphanage we were there. But, um, but what really struck me uh, in that experience, and if you've ever been on a mission trip, you, you know what I'm talking about, is that you know here we were, in another part of the world, another corner of the world, different culture, different language, and yet our, there was a unity we felt with these Korean Christians because we had the same Jesus. And if you've been overseas, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there, there's, there's, you're part of this new people, this new humanity in Christ. And that is really, bringing this back to the Tower of Babel, you know, the whole Tower of Babel motif or strategy, divide and conquer, it happened. That was God's strategy as he was building into Israel until the time of Jesus. When Jesus came, he came, he died on the cross for his sins, he rose again, and now he, he broke the power of sin, death, and the devil, and now he comes as the antidote to the sin disease, and then he gave a commission, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, which means people groups, and tell them about the cure. I'm the cure. Proclaim the cure. And then on the day of Pentecost, the the Holy Spirit falls and the, the, the birth of the church, the gathering, the gathering of believers is, is there and, and this Holy Spirit fills them. They begin to speak in other tongues, but the people uh, who are in Jerusalem at that time from different parts of the world, different people groups, they're Jews, but they're from different parts of the world, they understand what they're saying. And what happened there is it was really a reversal of the Tower of Babel. At the Tower of Babel, God confused the language. Nobody could understand each other. At Pentecost, suddenly everybody could. And Paul testifies to this incredible new strategy now that God is unleashing and acting in Ephesians chapter 2, 13 to 15. But now through Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So he is our peace. 
In his body, he has made Jewish and non-Jewish people one. By breaking down the wall of hostility that kept them apart, he brought an end to the commandments and demands found in Moses' teachings so that he could take Jewish and non-Jewish people and create one new humanity in himself. So he made peace. So God has been, ever since then, as the church was launched, reversing the strategy. It's now not divide and conquer. It's getting everybody into this new people of God. And, you know, sometimes we kind of, you know, when is Jesus going to come back? When is Jesus going to come back? He told us when he's going to come back. When every people have heard. When, when, the, when the cure has been announced to every people group, uh, that the cure is now available. For he talks about that. Uh, this gospel must go forth into every people group, and then the end will come, Jesus says. And there's a picture of that in Revelation chapter 7 of, of representatives from every people group gathered around the throne. And Revelation 22 gives kind of the culmination of that process, a picture of all people groups into one new humanity in Christ, returning to the garden, the tree of life. Uh, says this, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life access again to the tree of life in the garden. That's that picture. Bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding the fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the people groups of the nations back into one people of God tree. So we close. Just want to close with two questions. Um, Talked about redemptive analogies. God leaving a memory trace in every people group. Because he loves every people group. Um, he does that at an individual level too. I think you know that. What are the redemptive analogies? If you can think back to your own j- spiritual journey. Um, that God used in your life. Maybe an experience. Maybe it was a tough time. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. A mom, a dad. Uh, or maybe you know, something else. But, but what were the things that God implanted in you. Maybe in your, that it really helped the gospel click for you. Or, or maybe you're still in that process. Maybe you kind of think through that. What are some of the things that God might use to help me grasp? Um, that's going to be one of our questions in our small groups this coming week. The other just kind of question that I would just kind of leave us with is. If God really loves every people group so much to leave that memory trace of himself or a redemptive analogy or, or kind of preparing every people group for when the missionaries come with the gospel, there, there's something that they can use to share and for the gospel to click. Might he have done that for us today here too? As we're reaching out to Gig Harbor, people in our community, you know, in, in different pockets of our community, might we not be alone in wanting to bring the cure to them? Maybe God has gone before us. Maybe he's already preparing people. Maybe he's just waiting for us to walk through that door and actually to listen to people, to hear their story, not just start preaching the gospel, but listening for those analogies that God has implanted in them, hearing their story, and then discerning through the Holy Spirit, uh, taking those opportunities uh, to, to share with them. Sadly, the missionaries didn't get to Peru before the conquistadors. They waited too long. And so we too, we don't want to wait too long before we reach out to our neighbors here in Greek Harbor. Uh, but let's, let's do that with the assurance that we're not on our own, that God has got a plan. He's going to be for us. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and pray. Lord, you're the missionary God. You sent your son Jesus is a missionary to planet earth to actually adopt our culture, become one of us. And through that, die on the cross in our place and uh, be resurrected. And so I pray that you would give us grace to follow your lead, to be missionary people, to see ourselves on mission as we would go into our culture and we're appropriate to adopt the culture and hang out with people and, and get to know them and, and, uh, um, But through that, I pray that you give us eyes to see and hearts that are soft to look for those opportunities uh, to to share uh, the gospel when when there's something there that kind of helps us connect the dots for people. And pray that you give us grace to do that. Help us to be patient, to listen and and respect people where they're at and hear their story. Um, And I just thank you, Lord, that uh, as you call us to do that as a church, um, as we step out in faith, you're going to provide. You're going to provide those opportunities. But Lord, pray that we would not be afraid to do that or not be um, uh, just kind of 
free us from any kind of fortress mentality. I mean, this is a fantastic community. As Joel said, that is the strength of this church family is relationships. And, uh, and, and there is an openness, I know, to drawing others in. I, I've seen that. I've seen you do that. Let's not shrink back from that. Let's keep looking for ways to go into our community, to hang out, Ocean 5 or whatever, and invite people into a relationship that people are so hungering for. Give us grace to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.